Hello and welcome to another Perusia podcast. I'm Shabal Raish, uh, your host, and I'm excited about our guest. Uh, ha- have you ever heard of a uh, virtual Catholic conference? Uh, and they've been responsible for so many conferences. Have you also heard of just a guy in a pew, a very recent uh, apostolate that's been launched? Um, if you have, well, we're going to talk to the founder and co-founder of these apostolates, and we're going to learn about his faith journey today. He's none other than John Edwards. Hello, John. How are you doing? Hey, Charvel. It's great to be with you. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited uh, to get to speak in another country. This is really cool. So yeah, thanks for having then, me on. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. I've been watching yeah, a lot of your work, especially during the, the COVID time. Over the last year, I've really discovered what you've been up to and um, learning about you and and, and just getting a glimpse of your, your testimony, I think it's going to be wonderful to, for people to learn about what you've gone through, what God has done in your life, and, um, and how you are now dedicating your life to serving the Lord through the apostolates that you're, you're involved in. So I'm keen to dive in and learn more about you. Who are you? Where are you from? What was your upbringing like? Let's go in. <laughs> sure, if you're ready sure. To take this. So let's start from the beginning. Uh, where, are you, yeah. where were you sort of born and raised, and, and were sure. you a, a practicing um, faithful. You weren't Catholic, I understand. So let's let's talk right. about that. That's correct. Well, first of all, I'm 42 years old. I was born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee, still live here. Uh, the only one in my family left, everybody else has sort of moved out uh, or back around the area. But I've been here, you know, ever since I was born. I was born and raised Baptist, uh, Southern Baptist, as it were. And I was in the church every day it was open from the time I can remember. Um, some of my friends, the greatest friends I've had in my life, there's baby pictures of us together in this Baptist church, you know, and so every day when the church was open, I was, I was there. I, I loved evangelizing, going to vacation Bible schools, leading uh, church camps in the summer, uh, going on what we would call mission trips or centrifuge trips, uh, all the way up until I was about 18. And that church, once you got past the, the age of 18, it was predominantly older. And there was a lot of elderly folks. So there wasn't a lot of things left there after you left the youth group. And living in Memphis, it's sort of in the middle of the South, and it's a melting pot for people that have gone to colleges from all over. So you're in what we call here uh, the SEC conference, the football Mm -hmm. conference. So you have Tennessee, Alabama, Ole Miss, um, Kentucky, all these different schools that aren't really far from Memphis, and a lot of people's parents went to those universities. So they wanted to follow in their parents' footsteps. So all all of a sudden, at the age of 18, this, this home, this family that I'd known in the church, my youth group, they all just shot out and left Memphis. They went to different places. And for the first time in my life, I was alone. Now I'd gone to an Episcopal school growing up. Uh, so I kind of ran the gambit of a lot of things here, but I, I didn't have a lot of friends in school. Like I said, my friends were there in that church. So when we got to the age of 18, everybody left and I was there to make a decision. You know, I was going, okay, what am I going to do with my life? I was never a guy that knew you know, I want to be a doctor or an accountant or a lawyer. Um, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. And I'd started working for a company called Napa Auto Parts when I was 16 years old and was continuing to do that. Well, I made the decision to enroll in college because that's what you're supposed to do, right? You're supposed to graduate high school <laughs> and go to college or maybe find a vocation of, of some sort. So I went to the University of Memphis, a local university here. And I remember uh, Charbel walking on to campus that first day and being surrounded by thousands of people. But I didn't know a single soul for the first time in a long time in my life. And I felt so alone. You know, I just Mm. felt so lonely. I'd go to these classes and, you know, beautiful girls would be in the room that I'd want to talk to. And, you know, they weren't really talking to me. I'd, you know, try to strike up friendships with guys and that wasn't really working out. Everybody just kind of came and did their work and left, you know, and and went on to whatever else they were doing. So as as I said, I was very, very lonely. And one night I ran into a guy uh, out at a restaurant that had gone to my church that was four, four, I think it was about four years older than me. He was the rush chairman at a fraternity, uh, you know, there at the University of Memphis. And I told him, I said, man, I miss everybody. I, I don't really have any friends in my life anymore. And he said, well, you got to, you got to come and rush this fraternity. I was like, I don't know, man. Like I've never really been into drinking and all that stuff. And, oh, it's not all about that. It's about brotherhood, all that. So I said, yes. And I went and rushed and I got in and Charbel that day that I made it into the fraternity was the last day I went to church for about 10 years of my life. Um, All of a sudden 
you know, I, I was in this group of people. I was, I was wanting to make friends. I wanted community again, you know, searching for a place to belong. And I tell this to high school kids a lot when I give talks is, yeah. you know, that are seniors or they're juniors and they're about to embark on this journey away from home. And they're all excited for this freedom they're going to get. Well, freedom's a good thing if you know who you are. But you see, I lost who I was in this. And all of a sudden, I started to look to others to tell me who I should be or, or who, I, who they wanted me to be. Uh, at this time, I'd been working at Napa Auto Parts for since I was 16. I was about you know 19 or 20 at the time. Um, I was making about $35,000 a year as, as you know, working as a warehouse manager and going to school. Uh, next thing you know, I started trying to be everything to everybody. People found out I, I made good money. I mean, for a kid in college, $35,000 a year is a lot of money. And so they started coming to me. Can you, hey, you know, you've got a car. Can you drive us places? You know, you got money. Can you get us into clubs and pay for us all to go to bars and clubs? Hey, you can buy the booze. So that's what I started doing. I'm going, man, I got all these people that like me now and I've got plenty of money. I'll, I, you know, I'll spread it around everywhere. So that started happening. I started being surrounded by a lot of people and, and it was, you know, called, I guess, cool at the time. And next thing you know, I started drinking. I started uh, partying heavily. Uh, I was really chasing a lot of women. I was very promiscuous at that time in my life. Um, just everything that I'd learned growing up went out the window. Uh, drugs were everywhere. You know, everybody smoked a lot of marijuana. People were doing pills, ecstasy, LSD. I did every bit of that. And then Charbel, one night, I, I'll never forget the night that I, that I chose to do cocaine. You know, it was one of these things that I never thought, you know, that I was going to do. I really never thought I'd do any drugs. But uh, mm -hmm. this night in particular, or day in particular, I was at a friend's house and we'd been watching the NFL all day and just drinking beer and cooking out and uh, you know, smoking marijuana. And, uh, you know, I, I got up to, to get ready to go. And I realized I was like, man, I'm, I, I don't know that I feel safe to drive. I've had a little too much to drink or the mix of the drugs, whatever it was. Um, and at that time there was no, you know, Uber or Lyft or any of that stuff around, you know, and Memphis wasn't just full of taxis. So I got up to go to the restroom in the back of this house. And, and I noticed that some of the guys had disappeared uh, and they'd been gone a little bit. Well, as I made it my way down this hallway, I opened this door that was cracked. I could hear voices and there was a bunch of guys and they had lines of cocaine out on this dresser. Well, I'd never seen it before, never been around it. Certainly didn't know these guys were doing it. And they looked at me and they said, Hey, you said you were, you were drunk earlier and you didn't know if you could drive. Well, if you take a little bit of this, it'll wake you up and you'll be fine. And Charvel, looking back, I can remember thinking like being a little kid in the backseat of my mm -hmm. parents' car, telling them I'd never do drugs. I'd never do this. But for whatever reason that night, I made that terrible mistake and I, and I took a little bit of that cocaine that night. Felt like I could run through a wall. My heart was blowing out of my chest. It was crazy. But I got in my car a few minutes later, an hour later, and was able to drive home. And I told myself I'll never do it again, right? That was it. That was dumb. I don't want anything to do with it. I could tell why people from just that little bit would be you know, addicted to it. Yes. So. I told myself I wasn't going to do it again. Well, Friday night, you know, my buddies call me and, hey, we're going to go out. And so I went to one of their houses. And now because they had seen me, they, they knew that I knew about it now. It was openly in front of me. They were, you know, on the coffee table or whatever, right in front of me. And I just gave into peer pressure. I just started doing it, you know, and we would do cocaine. We'd go out downtown in Memphis, uh, you know, looking for, for women on Friday nights and mm -hmm. Saturday nights. And all of a sudden we sort of pulled away from the fraternity and there was this core group of us that would just hang out together. We do, you know, drink a lot, do drugs, go out. Well, then all of a sudden we stopped going out and we were sitting around the house, just doing the drugs all the time. We always had the intention of leaving, but we never did. And we were buying more and more and more. Then I broke another rule. I told myself I would never, that I would never break. I, I said, I'd never have the guy's number, the dealer's number. I'd never call him and buy it on my own. I would just always do it when I was around somebody else all of these dominoes started falling mm -hmm. and I started doing this stuff more and more. Next thing you know, I had the guy's number. I was meeting him on my own. Uh, you know, I, I started doing about $40 worth of cocaine every other night or every night, some nights I started drinking 15 or 20 beers. This group of guys, some of them started just maturing and growing up and leaving it behind. But there was me and a couple of other guys that didn't. Um, the whole time I'm still working at Napa auto parts. I have been, 
Um, I've, I've been promoted again and again and again. So on the outside looking in, Charvel, I'm this young guy that's that's now making six figures as an outside salesman for this company. Uh, you know, it looks like I got everything going for me, very successful. I was salesman of the year for the Fortune 250 company multiple years. Wow. And from the outside looking in, it looked like I had everything, you know, figured out, but I was broken. I was addicted. I was a mess. I was self-conscious. Um, I had all these masks. You know, I was this guy at this place and this guy at work and this guy at school and this guy with this group of friends. I never even knew who I was anymore. I was lonely. I'd aged out of really the college age. So, you know, there weren't any women in my life. You know, I didn't have a girlfriend and I, I was so lonely. Uh, and one night I was in Memphis here, uh, went out to a sports bar on a Friday night with some of those guys. And this girl walks in that I'd known in college and hadn't seen in years. Well, that girl turns out to now be my wife. She came <laughs> in there that night and she didn't recognize me. I'd put on weight. I had like a goatee or something that probably wasn't good looking at all, but like <laughs> I had changed. And, uh, and she sent a friend over to, to ask me, you know, if I would come talk to her and I did. And we realized we, she realized that we knew each other and we decided to go out that night and have some dinner. And then we started dating from that point on, you know, a year or so later we got married. Now I thought right. Charbel that this is it. This is what I've been waiting for. Right? Like, I, I've been waiting for something to make me grow up, to make me put all this stuff away. As St. Paul yes. says, to put away childish things. And it didn't work. You know, I, I have this beautiful woman that I've fallen in love with. We get married. Doesn't work. I'm still doing the cocaine. She doesn't know about it. You know, I'm sitting there every day going to work, making a ton of money. We've got a happy life. But I'm sitting there doing cocaine in the bathroom or after she goes to bed at night. Um, you know, and it continues to get harder and harder. You know, I'm doing it more and more. Um, about a year or so after we're married, uh, we decide to start talking about having children. And I'm thinking, this is it. I got to stop. You know, the last thing I want to do is, is have a child born, you know, with something wrong with him or her because of my choices, right? Because of yes. the effects of the, dr the drugs I was doing. So I told myself I was going to stop. I didn't. All through, con you know, when we were trying to conceive, I was still doing it. Uh, we had a son, Jacob, he's now 11, came out completely, perfectly healthy. Thank you for the great, you know, the grace of God yes. with that. But I thought mm -hmm. this is it, right? I've always wanted to be a father. I've always wanted to be a dad and especially to a boy, right? I got a boy the first time and, and, and this is what I've always wanted. And I thought I'm going to be the best dad. I'm going to teach him everything. I'm just going to, man, my life's going to be so amazing. I'm done with all these drugs and this drinking. Didn't happen. I still kept doing it. You know, I kept telling myself I was fine. I was performing at work. I was being a good dad. But the truth is, I wasn't Charbel. I was selfish. I did what I wanted to do all the time. The money I was making was my money. It wasn't our money. Um, it, it just, it kept getting worse and worse. Well, along there, right after Jacob died, about a year after he was, he was about a year old. Or excuse me, after, I didn't mean Sorry, Jacob yeah. died. After Jacob was born, born. my mother I, passed I, I was going to say this. Uh, so yeah. he, he's alive I'm, now? Yes, he's alive. I'm yes, sorry. Okay. I made a mistake there. Okay. What I meant to say was a year after Jacob was born, my yeah. mother passed away. She, okay. uh, she had breast cancer and we found out about five years before, looked like she was beating it every year. Test came back well. Well, right after Jacob was born, uh, I went to the doctor with her for the first time ever. Just one day I said, I'm going to go with you and dad. And uh, I found out in that visit that it had moved from her breast to her lymph nodes over to her lungs and then to her brain. And in that appointment is when we found out it was in her brain and that she only had, um, you know, uh, maybe a month or two left to live. Wow. Now this whole time I had not been going to church. I had, you know, I became Catholic when I married my wife. Now she was a, a cradle Catholic. And she said along the way, when we were dating, she said, you know, the man that I marry will be Catholic. And so I was like, well, I'm the man for the job, right? I'll sign up. And so I left my Baptist yeah. faith, which I wasn't even practicing anymore, became Catholic, yeah. thought I was being chivalrous, you know, and, and, you know, giving up my faith for hers. But the fact is, I really resented it. You know, I, I went to church with her under protest. Half the time I was thinking about, you know, what we were going to get at the grocery store after mass or, mm -hmm. or what football game I was missing, going to mass, all that kind of stuff. Well, as I said, my relationship wasn't that great with Christ. Then my mother dies and I completely blame God, right? I, I look around, I look at my life, the liar I was, how selfish I was. And I begin to think, why in the world would you take this woman, this, this church going Baptist woman who puts everyone 
else ahead of her in life, like everybody, not just our family, but anyone she met, she was the sweetest yeah. woman ever. Why would you take someone like her and leave someone like me? Why do I get to live and someone like her has to die? And I remember in the driveway of my parents' house as they pulled off to go to their farm outside of town um, to deal with all of the knowledge of what was going to happen to my mom. I just remember just kicking the porch, just the, the center blocks of the porch and just saying, I hate you, God. I hate you. I'll never worship you again. I never love you. I'll never serve you. You're dead to me, you know? And my mother died not long after that. And the rage kind of continued, you know, and, and it just, it threw my drug abuse and my drinking into overdrive. I hurt so much, wow. but yet I was raised to be a man and not complain and, you know, not have tears. And so I never opened up with anybody. I just was angry all the time. The only time I ever shared or, or broke down at all was when I was in the shower, I turned the radio up real loud and, you know, have a good cry every once in a while and beat the wall, but I'd never open up with anybody. So I, I started drinking 15, 18 beers a night and started doing every a lot night. of cocaine. Yeah. Every night was coming home. I was hiding fresh beer in the old 12 pack. So it wouldn't look any different. You know, yeah. if Angel looked at it and the box was ripped differently, uh, my whole life became just a big secret. And the whole time I'm still a successful salesperson. I have, I'm a hundred percent commission guy, you know, all the stress of that, you know, if I lost a certain customer, I'd lose half my business. And the stress of that was just adding to all this. Well, along the way, shortly after that, we had a set of twin girls, Allison and Caitlin. They're now eight beautiful, red haired, blue eyed girls, <laughs> as healthy as could be. And I thought, this is it, right? I got three kids, you know, I'm into my thirties. I've got to grow up and this is going to be it. You know, I can't, I can't sit around and do what I'm doing anymore. Didn't happen. I continued to do what I was doing. I was mm. there to help Angela when she absolutely needed it. But other than that, I was absentee and I was living my own life. It got to the point where Angela would just go back to bed every night. There was no intimacy. There was no, she just kind of said, I don't know what's going on with him. I don't know, but I'm, I'm going to bed. I'm having to deal with kids and raising kids. Mm. And I just, I can't deal with that. So Charbel at night, I would sit up till one or two in the morning, just doing cocaine, drinking beer after beer after beer, falling into bed, waking up, being fine to go to work and performing all day, but 4.30 or 5 in the afternoon, falling, falling back into, you know, the drugs and the alcohol every night. So this one night I'm sitting there and I'd also developed a porn problem during this time too, because I wasn't going back to be intimate with my wife in any way. Uh, I was afraid of the effects of the drugs and her finding out, you know, that I was, that I was doing drugs. So I would start to watch pornography every night before I went to bed. So I developed a cocaine problem, a drinking problem, and a porn problem. Um, one night I was sitting there till about two in the morning. I went back to our bedroom, you know, washed my face, crawled into bed, was asleep there for about 10 minutes. And uh, I was thrown up out of bed. Like I just, I sat up in the bed. My heart felt like it was going to blow out of my chest. I, I looked over at Angela. She was asleep. I crawled out of the bed, hit the floor and crawled into, you know, our bathroom there at the time in our old house, pulled myself up to the commode. And I thought, this is it. I'm going to die. Like, this is what you see in movies when you keep doing this stuff too much. You're going to you're gonna have yeah. a heart attack. I'm, I'm going to die right here. And so I remember thinking, I need to tell Angela to call an ambulance. I need her to call an ambulance. Um, and, and the thought came across my mind, Charvella said, I'd rather die right here than her find out what I've been doing and have to deal with that. I'll lose everything. I'll lose, my, I'll lose her. I'll lose my kids. You know, I'll lose the money, the house, everything. I'll lose everything I've worked hard for. And so I just sat there and, and, and I kept thinking I need to speak to God, but like I said, I, I hated him, you know, and I, and I, even at that point, I wouldn't, my pride would not allow me to, to hit my knees and ask for his help. So I shoved my face in a towel and I, I started trying to catch my breath. And I eventually did. I got up off of the commode. I got back in bed and I said, I'll never, I'll never do this again. I'll throw the drugs out in the morning, all of that. I got up the next day and I did that. I threw out the drugs, but I was back the next evening at four 30 buying more. And I sat there and I did the same thing the very next night. I go back to bed, thrown up out of bed, heart busting out of chest, hit the floor, crawl to the bathroom and pull myself up on the commode. And this time I'm thinking, all right, I don't know how many strikes I'm going to get. And God, as much as I don't care for you, as much as I don't want to admit that I need your help, I need to be better in my life. I've got to stop this stuff. And I know there's a men's conference in our diocese coming up this weekend. My father-in-law had invited me a bunch of times. He was a very, you know, cradle, cradle Catholic, uh, just, just uber Catholic, you know, guy. Wow. And I, uh, and I always told him, no, always found an excuse, but mm -hmm. I said, I, I want to go to confession. I've been one time and it was during my RCIA class. 
And that was it in 10 years of being a Catholic. This was at 37, about 37 years old. So my heart stops, you know, I slow my, my breathing, my heart calms back down. I get back into bed. Angel's none the wiser. Um, and then I prepare to go to that conference that weekend. So I show up, uh, I think father Mike Schmitz was or the crossing, the goal guys, Daniel Branowitz, all oh, those yeah. guys were speaking. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. And I got to tell you, Charbel, I couldn't tell you what they said because I, all I was wanting to do was go to confession. I just wanted to go to confession. I wanted to go there where we were surrounded by 30 priests. They were hearing these thousands of guys, you know, confessions and I could find one I didn't know. So when it came time for confession, I went and did that walk of shame we've all done where you're walking down the hallway and you're going, nope, I know him. Nope, I know him. And you're trying <laughs> to find a priest you don't know. So I finally found one that was from outside of Memphis. And I went in and I sat down and it was this very crotchety old looking priest. He just didn't look even happy to be there. I don't know <laughs> why, but it was just like of all the guys, this is the one I picked. But I opened the door. I go in, I sit down. And for the first time in a long time in my life, I, I told somebody the truth. You know, I didn't even know where to start. I just started just unloading and, uh, you know, and told him everything. And I was crying, just just coming forth with everything. And he said, uh, I said, the last thing I said was, I want to stop, but I don't want to get in trouble. And he lost it. He got so mad. He's like, it's not up to you how God wants to change your life. And if you're serious and you want absolution, then you need to make a serious act of contrition. You need to, you know, truly be here to repent and reconcile and not just trying to make yourself feel better. And the guy's yelling at me and I'm going like, okay, I thought Jesus was supposed to be nice. You know, why are you yelling at me? And, but he was trying to get me to be serious about what I was doing. And so I told him, yes, father, I want to be different. I want to change. I want to be the husband and father that I've always supposed to been have been. And so he gave me absolution. He retired shortly after that. I don't know if it was my fault for all the yeah. stuff that I loaded <laughs> no, on him or not, but, no. <laughs> but uh, I leave out of that room and I, and I said, that's it. I'm going to change my life. So I go home that Saturday evening. I, I throw out the drugs. I pour out the booze and I changed my life for about five days. You know, it was hard Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm going to work on the way home. I would feel like I was going to vomit every night because my body had become so accustomed at yeah. that time to going and get the things I needed. And when I started to deny myself, then my body started to just, you know, to, re to revolt basically. Um, so I made it all the way to Thursday. Now this is Holy week. This is Holy Thursday. I go down to a customer's uh, shop, a garage. He was going to add on to his, his garage where he worked on cars. I'd been working on the sale for a long time. It was going to be almost like 200 and something thousand dollars in equipment. He was going to buy more money in that one sale than I'd made all year. Yeah. And he told me that day, he's like, send it. Here's the PO, you know, here's, here's your purchase order, order it, bill me for it. I got so excited, Charbel. I was driving home and it was like all these endorphins fired off and I just wanted to celebrate. And I told myself, I was like, well, you know, I, I know I told God I wouldn't do this, but if it's, it's just a little bit, right. I'll just go do a little bit. So I, put, I call this guy a million times. Oddly enough, he lived down the street from Elvis Presley's Graceland. But <laughs> I, I passed this exit, and I'm supposed to be picking up my son Jacob uh, from my father-in-law's. I get almost out to my father-in-law's house. The dealer wouldn't answer. He winds up calling me back. So I turn the car around. I go all the way back down to this guy's house. I run in, get my usual 40 bucks, speed off down the street, and realize I'm almost out of gas. I pull in a gas station. All of a sudden, I hear whoop, whoop. I hear a siren behind me and I look in the rearview mirror and the, and the drug enforcement agency is behind my car. Next thing you know, they grab me, they throw me out of the car. They throw me up against the car. They're saying, where are the drugs? Where are the drugs? They find them in my sock. Now I'm a guy that's never been in trouble in my life, never been to jail, mm -hmm. any of that. So next thing you know, I'm handcuffed and thrown in the back of a Tahoe, you know, Chevy Tahoe. They, they take me down to organized crime. They start shaking me down. I'm chained to a bench. Uh, and they tell me that if I help them, I won't go to jail. Well, after talking to him for a little bit and them just, just beating up on me basically verbally and, and, and all of that stuff, trying to get me to say something about the person I was getting it from, they come in and they, they uncuff me, they cuff me again and then throw me in the back of a police car and they take me to downtown Memphis to where the jail is. And this whole time, it's been three or four hours since my wife's heard from me. Nobody's seen me, I'm supposed to have picked up my son. Uh, we're in the line to go into the jail for them to drop me off. And these two police officers are sitting there in the front of the car and they look in the rear view mirror and they say, Hey man, what's with you? You don't look like somebody's ever been in trouble. And I said, I haven't, I, I've made mistakes. I've, I'm addicted to something. I was very stupid. And all I want to do is call my wife and tell her I'm okay. 
And the guy looks at me in the rearview mirror, this police officer, and he says, we're not, we're in line. We're not going anywhere in, for a while. I can't give you your phone, but I can call your wife for you and put it to your ear while we're sitting here. Okay. I said, you would do that? And he said, yeah, I'll do it. And I said, but I don't know what I'm going to say to her. I'm, I'm scared of what she's going to say to me. And he said, well, huh. is this about you or is this about her? And Charbel, that was looking oh, back. I mean, it was, it was almost like the voice of God, right? My whole life had been about me. Um, and, and so I asked him, I said, I said, yes, please. And so he put the phone to my ear. I called my wife. She was worried. John, where are you? Where are you? Are you okay? I said, Angel, I'm in the back of a police car headed into downtown uh, Memphis, the jail in downtown Memphis. Uh, I've been arrested with possession of cocaine. And there was silence on the end. And then all of a sudden she said, I hate you. And she hung up. And I didn't blame her. You know, she knew something had been going on. It was like the final puzzle piece had been given to her, right? Like, why is he up so late? Why is he drinking so much? All of this. So I just put my head down. They drove me into the jail. They put me in this big room with all these other people. Memphis is like one of the third uh, most dangerous in, in crime in the United States for murders and things like that. So it's not the place you want to go to jail. Yeah, it's not the place you want to go to jail. Not that you ever want to go to jail, but this is not like one of the ones you would pick. So I go in there. I sit down. It's, it's four in the morning. They take me back for the mug shots like you see in the movies and all yeah. of that. Um, it's starting to hit me now. I'm not getting out of this, right? I told myself I'm a salesman. I get out of everything, but I wasn't getting out of this. So I'm watching guys beat up on each other. I'm watching Bayless fighting inmates. It's, it's just, it's, I've never seen anything like it. So mm. I'm arrested at, you know, in, in jail at seven, it's now four in the morning, take my mug shot and they take me back to this room and they say, okay, well, you gotta, you gotta undress. Here's a bag of scrubs, uh, shoes to wear, uh, you know, blankets, toothbrush, paper towel, or, or toilet paper, all of that. That's when it hit me. There was a phone uh, there and they said, you could make one more phone call. I called my wife. It was four in the morning. She picked it up. She said, John, I know you're in jail. I don't care. I got to get the kids to school and I got to be at work and do it all because you're not here. I don't care if you're rotten there. And she hangs up the phone. Yeah, wow. So, so I get in, I get in the line with all these guys and it's just like you see in law and order or something or a TV show, yeah. you go down this cell block. And I get to the last one and they say, you know, inmates turn and face your cells. And all I see is these wrought iron board uh, bars, a, a double bunk bed and uh, a stainless steel toilet in a five by six room, maybe. So the door opens, they tell us to walk in, turn around, I'm holding all my stuff. And then I watch this door, this jail cell door, just, 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 boom. And that lock hit. And it was like, all right, my life's over for the first time since I was a kid. I, I, I'm not in control of where I can go, what I can eat, anything in my life. Like I, I'm, I'm totally powerless here. So I turn around. I hadn't slept or ate in over 24 hours. I, I look at this nasty bed with gosh knows what that was on these mattresses. I took a blanket. I threw it down on the bottom bunk. I laid down on it and pulled another one over the top of me. And by the grace of God, I passed out face down in the bed. The next morning, I wake up and, and I don't, I, I wake up under the blanket still in the same position and it's dark, you know, and I'm going, okay, God, thank you. Thank you so much. This was a nightmare. I promise you I'll stop. I'll never do this again. And then I sat up and my head hit the bottom of a steel bunk bed. You know, all of a sudden the covers fell off of me. I started going, no, 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 no. I threw my legs over the side of the bed. I'm sitting this close to a cinder block wall and I'm just rocking back and forth, just going night into nothing. Charbel going, no, no, this, this, this can't be real. No, 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 no. I'm going to lose everything. I'm going to lose my wife, my kids, my job. Everybody's going to know. Everybody's going to find out. I'm going to lose everything. And then all of a sudden I just stop. And this crazy, I don't even really know how to describe this crazy peace came over me. And it was like all that weight just fell off of me. And I uttered probably the most true words I've ever said in my life. I just looked down at the floor and I said, at least now I don't have to lie anymore. You know, at least now everybody will know who I am. And in that moment, I just started to realize, all right, I, I can't control if my wife's going to leave me. I can't control if I'm going to lose my job. I can't control if I'm going to be, you know, allowed to see my kids. All I can, all I realize is that I've gotten myself into a place and I can't get myself out of it alone. And that it all seemed to happen when I walked away from Jesus. And so I sat there in that cell and I had a conversation with him. I was crying and I remember saying, God, I'm so sorry. Like, how could I have ever said, I hate you? How could I have ever, and, and looking back now, it was almost like Christ was, had his arm around me that, on that bed and was going, John, 
I was what you needed me to be, right? I was what you needed me to be. But now I need you to be something different, right? I need you to be something different than you are. I need you to be the husband. You should have been to Angela. I need you to be the father. You should have been to Jacob and Caitlin and Allison. I need you to grow up and be the man that I made you to be, the guy, the kid that I loved growing up that was doing all these things, right? Doing the right things. And so I had that conversation with him. And, and shortly out after that, this bailiff shows up, the door opens up and she says, all right, you get a phone call and you get a shower. Well, I'd seen a lot of prison movies. I wasn't really interested in the shower part, right? I'm not, <laughs> not trying to be crude, but I didn't know what was going on with all of that. So I said, I'll take the phone call. I called everybody I knew, all my fraternity brothers, all the guys I'd blown that money on, thinking brothers for life. Not a single one of them answered the phone. No one in my life answered the phone. It was the loneliest I've ever felt in my life. Like this is my one opportunity to get out of here and I can't get a hold of anybody. Well, I finally got a hold of my sister at my dad's farm down in Mississippi, which is uh, south of, of Memphis, Tennessee. She called, said, we know that you're in jail. Angela's across the street bailing you out now. Um, you're going to be able to come home tonight. You should be out about nine. You're not going to get to go home. Angela's going to take the kids and go to her parents. I'm going to come get you and I'm going to take you to your house to get clothes. And then you're going to have to go stay at dad's. Now, this is Good Friday, right? I hang the phone up a few minutes later. My wife, or the bailiff shows up and says, you have a visitor. I walk in there, same thing again, seen from the movies, the glass, the, the pay phone, talking yes. to family on the other side. It's my wife and my mother-in-law. They're crying. I'm crying. I'm apologizing. And my wife just says, John, I know you're probably worried if I'm going to divorce you. I'm not going to divorce you, but it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with the vows that I made to God in the, in the church. And at that time, honestly, I was like, I just, all I heard was, I, I, I'm not going to divorce you, right? Yeah, so yeah. she says, you, you got to go to your dad's. And so she said goodbye. That was the last time I talked to her for several days. I went back to myself, sat there. They called me, let me out about 930. I get my cell phone. I look down. I have tons of calls from my work. They, somebody found out about what had happened to me, and they knew about it. Um, and I walk outside the jail thinking my sister's going to be there, but it wasn't my sister. It was my father. Mm -hmm. And my father grew up on a farm with six kids. There wasn't a lot of, I love you's and I'm proud of you's or any of that growing up. It was, we know how to work hard and we're just not real emotional people. So yeah. you can imagine I'm a six foot eight, 265 pound guy, but I walked up to my six foot dad, like I was three years old and I'd broken something in the house, right? Like just scared of what's going to happen. And I'll never forget Charbel. He just looked at me with a smile on his face <laughs> and he, and he grabbed me and he hugged me and he said, are you okay? I love you. Wow. I, I would have killed to hear those words from my father growing up. But at this time yeah. he said, them. we get in the car, we go to my house, we grab clothes and I open the back door to my house where this, the den is where the family usually spent time together and my kids aren't there. I'm wondering if I'm ever going to see him really again. Um, you know, in the way that I had, um, we grab my clothes. We go to my dad's farm on the way down there. He starts to ask me questions. Like, was I a bad dad? Is this my fault? And I just told no. him, dad, no, like I'm a grown man. I made my decisions. You did, this had nothing to do with you. You know, you were a good dad. So we get down there. It's Friday night. Like I said, it was, it was good Friday, Saturday morning. I sit there. My aunt has come down. She doesn't know what's going on. My sister's there. Uh, I'm having a lot of people because my aunts were older and I just didn't really want to to, you know, impact them with, with what I'd been doing in my life. Um, even though they were asking me, where's your wife, where are your kids? Why are they not here? So I sat through all of that and all I could think about was how my wife's big Italian family was going to have all these people over for Easter Sunday. And when Angel walked in the room, it would just be silence, right? Because everybody yeah. would know. And the elephant in the room and this, the stress that I would put on her and the shame and all of that. So I woke up on Easter Sunday and in this town of Bruce, Mississippi, that's got maybe 700 people in it. There's a Catholic room. It's not even a church because you're in the middle of, you know, Methodist, Baptist, <laughs> you know, everything. So we had gone there once before, about five years before and to, to a Christmas mass when Angela took me when we were down there for Christmas. It was like, a, we'll go down to your dad's if we can go to that church. Mm -hmm. So I said, yes, we went in there um, four years before that. So I knew this church was there and they had a Sunday service. So I go down to this room at 11 o'clock. I borrow my dad's car and I show up and it's locked. No one's there. I get back in the car and I'm going, God, really? The one time in 10 years I want to go to mass and I can't go. I'm beating the steering wheel. I'm crying. I'm angry. And next thing I know, this sister pulls up 
who I'd forgotten kind of ran the, the, the masses or had communion services whenever the traveling priest between these smaller towns wasn't at that, that particular church or parish. So she pulls up and she knocks on my window and she's like, what's the matter with you? You know, <laughs> cause I'm crying and yelling. And I said, I just want to go to mass. And she just looked at me like, okay, well, it's Easter. <laughs> you know, this is too small. We have thousands, you know, we have hundreds of people that are down at this agricultural center in the next town. Do you know where it is? I said, yeah, I know exactly where it is. We'd had family reunions there before. So I get in the car, I, I, I race down there. I go inside, there's all these families and I sit down and this priest, it's the same priest that we had seen four years before in this church. He gives this beautiful homily in Spanish and English. You know, the whole mass is beautiful. And I get up and I say, you know, I don't want to stay there having a, a dinner afterwards or lunch afterwards for Easter. And it was hurting me to see all these families and not be with mine. So I just headed for the door. As soon as I touched the door, I knew no one in the room. Somebody touched my shoulder. I turn around, I look, and it's this priest. And he says, hello, John. He remembered my name from four years, five years before meeting me one time for about three seconds. <laughs> and he said, I don't know where your family is or why they're not here. But God wants me to tell you that everything's going to be all right. And I just looked at him and I was like, how could you know? And he just said, it's good to see you, John. And he turned around and he walked off. And so I got in the car and I said, that's it. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to be a better man. I'm going to get my family back. I'm going to live for Christ. Got in the car, went to my dad's, went home the next day. I had a court date. I had to go to court and plead guilty to this here in the States, or at least in Memphis, they have a program where uh, they're trying to keep uh, repeat offended drug dealers out of jail by putting them in something called diversion. They could pay and, and go to counseling and these things. And so I did that. Um, and, and so I pled guilty. I went to my work and, and, and had a meeting with them, answered all their questions, um, left there and decided on my own to check myself into a behavioral science center. Um, this was not court ordered. My wife knew nothing about it. I had my dad drop me off there. Charvel, I go in there. And one person after the next is worse than the other. Guys on crystal meth, on heroin, scratching their skin, thinking that there's bugs on them. I've never seen anything like it. I sit down in there and there's a, a door in this waiting room that's coming one after another people into this room. I'm sitting there and I can't take it anymore. Family members throwing their kids in the floor and saying, this is it. This is the 12th time that I've, I, I, we give up. He's yours. Take him. You know, just one after another. There's a newspaper by me. I grab it and I pick it up just so I don't have to watch it, any of this anymore. I'm not even reading it. I'm just blocking my view. Well, all of a sudden the door over my shoulder opens and nobody walks by. I lower the paper and it's my wife who I've not talked to since Friday. And I said, Angel, what, what are you doing here? Like, you know, how did you know I was here? What are you doing here? She goes, John, I'm, I'm mad as hell at you, but I can't let you go through this alone. I can't let you go through this alone. So she sat down with me. We, we went in and I was assessed. I went into a 30 day outpatient program. And as I left that, that day from being assessed, I was ready to get back in the car with my dad and go to his farm. And Angela said, John, I know that I told you, you couldn't come home, but quite frankly, your daughters are asking if you're dead. And I'm not going to ask your dad to drive two hours up here twice a day to bring you back for all of this. So you're going to come home tonight. I'm not going to sleep in the bed with you. I'll sleep in Jacob's room with him but you can come home because I need you to take the kids to school and all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So I went home that night, I found myself in the bed in air conditioning in my bed with food that wasn't <laughs> cornbread and something disgusting and TV. And I was excited, right? I was like, yes, I'm back in my comfort zone until I looked next to me in the bed and it was empty. Mm -hmm. And I looked across the hall and I saw my wife doesn't like when I say the lump of her. So I'll say the shape of her yeah. in the bed across <laughs> the hall in my son's bed. And I said, this is it. Like, here I am excited to be home, but I can't just stop doing the drugs. I've got to be a better man. I got to be a better man. I can't let this go. And so I jumped up out of bed and I started looking for a Bible or anything to start reading. Now I was looking on my side of the bed. I probably should have looked on hers because she probably had 30 Bibles over there, but <laughs> I opened the drawer to the bedside table and I find Father Larry Richards, Be a Man book that my wow. father-in-law had given me five years before. Yeah. Wow. And, and I opened it up and I had like, it's over here somewhere. Actually, it's right here. I, uh, you know, right. I opened this book up. Yeah. And I had like the first three pages underlined and I was going to change my life five, six years before. And I threw that book down and, and went back to doing drugs. Well, that day, that night, I picked that book up and I read it cover to cover. 
when Angela got up in the morning, she said, what are you doing up so early? I said, I never went to bed. You know, I said, I'm so sorry for everything I've done. And of course she was hurt. She didn't want to hear all that, but mm-hmm. I made my mind up right then and there that I was going to start reading the Bible every day. I was going to start going to mass. I was going to start leading my family, you know, being the spiritual leader of my family. So I did. And so for a year at eight o'clock every night, I was by my bed praying so that my children found me there. After yeah. that, I would sit in the floor for hours and read scripture and just pray over it. All of a sudden, my Baptist roots started coming back with my knowledge of scripture. I'd read it, the Bible five times, probably by the time I was 15. So all of this started coming back, but now I was studying Catholicism the way I've always should have. And the beauty and the truth were colliding with the scripture. And now it wasn't black words on a white page anymore. It was messages that God was sending uniquely to me. I was personalizing the scripture and he was speaking into my life and showing me what it meant to be a man in his own image. So I started my trying to do that. I started going to daily mass. There was a priest that I went to one day in, in the parish we were going to. I went in that mass and I broke down crying. I didn't feel worthy to take the Eucharist. He called me up anyway. He took me to the confessional. I told him everything. And then he told me, he goes, you know what? Uh, he gave me absolution. But he said, you, you're not going to work right now because of the program you're in. So you're going to be here every morning for 815 mass. You're going to, you're going to lecture. I need someone to read as you saw this morning. I had no one. So you're going to read every day and you're going to be a confession every Friday. So between what God did through Father Larry's book and through my hunger for, for more knowledge about the faith. And then this wonderful priest who is now one of my best friends in the world. He's at my house every weekend. Wow. Guided me into this new man. So a year goes by, I go back to this conference, the same conference I went to before reluctantly this year, yeah. Father Mike Schmitz is speaking, uh, which was amazing. And then this young focused uh, missionary named Lee Vollmer got up and shared his witness about how he'd had a problem with cocaine and drinking and DUIs and all of these things um, and arrests. And I thought, what courage, what courage this young man has. So I found him afterwards and I told him that. I said, we have a similar story. And I just said, it meant so much to see what you did. So that night I go back to my parish. There's a fundraising event there, a basketball three-point shootout. There's another guy from my parish there. And he starts to say, he just starts to get loud. He's like, man, I went to this men's conference today. And, and, oh my gosh, I went to confession for the first time in 16 years. And I, woo, I told the priest this, and he's just like going nuts in this basketball gym. Now there's women and children present. And some of the things he was saying, he said in confession, I said, Hey Jay, you know, you need to, you need to quiet down. Everybody can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> well, he, he came to me. He said, John, why am I so excited? Why am I so excited? Like, I don't get it. I said, Jay, you had a, you had a moment. Like you went to confession after 16 years, the Holy spirit got a hold of you today. Right. And that's why you're feeling the way you are. He goes, I've been Catholic all my life. I know Jesus and I know God. I know nothing about the Holy spirit. Would you tell me? So I start to tell him. And then all of a sudden the guilt hits, right? Charbel, because no one in my life knew what had happened. We didn't tell anybody. I'd gotten Mm. involved in the parish coaching and things like that, but no one knew. My wife used to ask me all the time. Did you tell anybody? I said, no, I, I haven't because I'm afraid of what's going to happen if they find out. Yeah, so when yeah. Jay started asking me to talk about the Holy Spirit, I said, man, I can't, I can't, I'm not your guy. I immediately just started backpedaling and he didn't understand. He's like, why, why, why? I said, I'm not your guy, man. I just, there's a priest right there. They can explain it to you. That's what they do. Go see him. Well, he wouldn't let up. He said, let me take you to dinner. Let me take you to the pizza place Tuesday night. So he kept badgering me. And finally, I just said, fine, I'll go, I'll go. So that next day I'm sitting in my house after mass. I go, what am I going to tell this guy? Who am I to be talking about Jesus or anything? I sit down with a legal pad, Father Larry's book, the Bible. And next thing you know, I've got seven pages of information I've written down on the Holy Spirit. Just that God took me through what I remembered and all of that. I meet with him Tuesday night. We sit down, I share all this with him. And he goes, at the end of it, I mean, I I take him from the breath over over the water in Genesis all the way to Pentecost and beyond. And he takes me, afterwards he comes up, I mean, he just stops and he says, wow, this is amazing. You should start a men's group. (laughs) <laughs> and I said, I'm not your guy, man. Like, he goes, why? You say that every time. I said, Jay, I'm just, I can't, I can't share it with you, but I'm not the right person for this. You asked me to help you. I showed up. Here it is. Done deal, right? We're, we're through here, right? Let's shake on it. And he said, no, you got to start a men's group. And I finally just felt convicted by the Holy Spirit, Charbel. And I said, Jay, I can't because I was, I was addicted to cocaine for 17 years of my life. I just got out of jail a year ago. I almost lost my family. I'm not anybody that should or deserves to speak to you about Jesus Christ. And he just looked at me. I told him everything I just told you. And he said, that's incredible. You should start a men's group. And I was like, what 
what's wrong with you? Did you not hear what I said? But he convinced me. And a week later, we called all these men in the parish, people he knew and men that I, that I knew. Some I was friends with, some I didn't. We didn't tell them why they were there. We just said, be here Wednesday night. We'll bring beer so they would come and stay. And then we'll, we have something we want to talk to you about. So I show up that next Wednesday. I walk up to the parish uh, family life room. I'm walking in from the outside. It's the time of year where it's dark outside early. So they can't see me, but I could see them. All of a sudden, I see these 30 guys in there, and panic hits me because I know what I have to do. I have to tell them the same wow. thing that I told Jay. I grab for the door handle, and all of a sudden, I hear this, this voice, this something inside of me go, don't open that door. If hmm. you open that door, you're going to lose everything. Right. Everybody's going to know they're going to find out that you were a cokehead. They're going to kick you out of this parish. They'll kick your kids out of the school. Think about the embarrassment your wife's going to suffer. If you open that door, you're going to lose everything right now. You're comfortable. Nobody knows. And so I let go of the door and I turn around and start walking back to the car. I made it about three steps and I heard another still quiet voice. Like, like it talks about in the old Testament, right? God wasn't in the wind or the storm or the earthquake. He was in the still small voice. And it just inside of me, I felt something say, John, you told me you'd be different. You told me when you walked out of that jail cell, you'd be different. And so I turned around and I opened that door and I went in there. And these guys say, John, what are we doing? Why are we here? What's going on? I said, look, guys, we have a great fundraising arm of the parish here. We raise money for kids' basketball jerseys and for redoing the fields and all the stuff that the kids need. But we never talk about Jesus unless the priest is there to bless the meal and he's rarely there. Let me tell you how dangerous that can be in your life. And I just went blah. And I told him everything I told you. I was crying. All these guys' eyes were getting bigger with every gory detail. And I, I finally just finished. I mean, it was gross. I was just ugly crying. And I sat down and said, look, I think we need to have something spiritual for men here. I don't know what I'm doing, but I think we need something. And if you want to be a part of that, I'd love for you to stay and talk about it. If you don't and you, you didn't know why you were here, you can leave. There's no hard feelings. And I sat down and the guy next to me stood up, which was the guy who asked me to do all this, Jay. Yeah. And I thought he was going to leave. And I was about to get real mad. I was like, really? You're going to leave? You're the one that got me into this. Yeah. But I looked up and he was crying. And he said, I'm a terrible father. I care more about my wife and my kids than I do my, my uh, I care more about my job and money mm. than I do my wife and my kids because of the way I spend my time. The next guy said, I smoke pot all the time and my wife's going to leave me if I don't, if I don't stop and I can't stop. The next guy said, I'm addicted to pornography. The next guy says, I'm getting a divorce. The next guy says, I Ubered here. I'm drunk right now. I've been in a hotel room drinking a case of beer all day. My wife and I fought. I escaped a hotel room. My work thinks I'm at home sick. My wife thinks I'm at work. Around the room, like pistons in an engine, guys getting up and sitting down. And Charbel, that's the night that God showed me the power of vulnerability in my life. You know, I had no idea what was going on that night. But so many men in the world, we think that, that, you know, that we've got to be, that vulnerability is a sign of weakness. You know, the world tells us, That's you right. know, to be, to, to, that vulnerability means you're susceptible to attack. You're, you're, you're less of a man, you know, all of this stuff. But God has a different definition he gives to St. Paul. You know, he tells St. Paul, when St. Paul says, remove this thorn from my side three times, mm -hmm. God says, no, my power is made perfect in weakness. You know, it was that night that I figured that out. And St. Paul goes on to tell us, he says, you know, if I am to boast, let me boast of only my, my weaknesses, my hardships, my insults, my burdens, because when I'm weak, I'm strong. Mm -hmm. And I started to realize that most of us men, we've been, we've been raised to think like, put your head down, work hard, never complain, don't have any emotions. You got a problem, figure it out, because that's what men do. You don't need anybody else. So we wear all these masks, and we find ourselves often in the place that I found myself in. And becoming vulnerable that night, we started a men's group that meets every Wednesday night to this night, five years later. Men started finding out about in the diocese. They asked me to speak as a witness speaker at that conference the next year. I did. Cardinal Studios saw me there and heard my testimony, asked me to go start selling rise and strive for them with my sales background. I left a 23-year job at Napa Auto Parts that I thought I was going to retire to and 401ks and all that stuff and took a job paying a, a, third, a fourth of what I used to make and went into ministry. And about <laughs> the middle of that, I was in a Crescio group a deacon there that has a show called the Catholic cafe on EWTN deacon, De deacon Jeff Drzymski. He heard what I was doing with the men and he said, you need an outlet. I want to build you a podcast. And so he asked me what I would want it to be called. And I said, just a guy in the pew, because that's <laughs> what I always felt I was, was just a guy in the pew. 
and that God had shown me that any regular everyday guy can be more than just a guy on the pew. And so we started doing episodes. We've got 103 of those now. Mm -hmm. Uh, We started coming out with resources for men. I started speaking around the United States and in Canada. Um, And now uh, I I do just a guy on the pew and which is a a part of pew ministries, a nonprofit organization. Uh, I spend my time doing that. And then virtual Catholic conference that happened last year in that. So I know it's a very long story, but thank you for your patience and listening to it. But that's kind of where we are today. Man, amen, amen. Praise be to God. I, I Look, this is unusually, normally I, I would have lots of questions. I just couldn't help sit back and just take it all in because you're such a great storyteller, I tell you that much. Um, you. you very detailed and took us on a journey. Um, I, I just want to congratulate you, I mean, just for your honesty and your rawness. You're so raw and, and just, uh, like you said, vulnerable the way you started uh, this whole journey, the idea of wearing masks all the time, how common is that today? Can I just do a quick summary? And, and, and I want to just get the timeline right because um, sure. I, I was there with you the whole time and I'm just fascinated. <laughs> so you, you've, got a, uh, you've got your Baptist background. You've read the Bible five times. You're, you're a teenager. Things are going well. You, you're right there. You go into university or, or college. And, and that's where it's just a whole new world for you. You're trying to discover yourself. You've lost lots of your friends. And now this is where you get a taste of the partying lifestyle, the alcohol, the, the, the yeah. all, all of that. Then um, how long was that before? And I'd like to know just a timeline between um, sure. up until you first tried cocaine. So that, that segment there I was interested in finding. How sure. many years was it um, there? Sure. Uh, it was probably, I would say two, two and a half. So okay. I went in at 18, I believe I went my first, my first semester without pledging the fraternity. So yeah, I was about 19 when I joined the fraternity, I was smoking weed and drinking, you know, very shortly after I started um, okay. drinking heavily. And uh, it was about a year after that, when I got introduced to cocaine. Now, LSD, ecstasy pills, that was all in between there. Um, yeah. before I started doing cocaine. So I spent, you know, a good seven years before I got married uh, doing this almost every day of my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then afterwards, when I got married to Angela. Now, how old were you when you got married? Right about 28. 28. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, um, uh, and how soon was it after your marriage when you found yourself in jail? How long was that? I was 37. So it was almost, you know, I became Catholic when I was 27. So it was 10 years later um, when I was 37 on Holy Thursday when I got arrested. Okay. And now when you, um, your relationship with God right through, so right from, was it 18, 19? You didn't, you pretty much didn't have one Um, right Right. up until, until would you say right up until coming at that jail moment, that night in jail, would would that be probably the first real encounter of your life? Yeah, because with the Catholic, yeah, the Catholic faith for me was, I, I was raised Protestant, which is very yes. welcoming. It's very, you know, there's all these things, eight, eight people meet you in the parking lot to say hi to you before you even get in the door. Um, you know, Catholicism to me, I was like, we walk in here, no one speaks to you, you go and you leave, <laughs> all of this stuff. And so that was one thing I fought. I, I didn't ever really, I, I didn't believe in the real presence of the Eucharist until the day of Christ in the Eucharist. Uh, until that day that that priest took me uh, into the confessional, the one that had me read and and go to confession and all that after jail. Years Um, later. Yeah, that was the day that all that changed for me. So most of my life when we were married was me fighting every Sunday morning not to go to church, not to go to church at all. And there was even one day after I'd been in jail, you know, where where I was I was laying here and I just didn't want to go to church one morning. And I remember uh, I had the covers kind of pulled up over my head and the stairwell from my, the house I live in now came down in front of that door. And I heard my son going, well, I don't want to go to church. And Angela, I kind of looked over the covers and she was, you know, putting his you know, button in his collar or something. And he said, why do I have to go if dad doesn't have to go? And that's when I just threw myself out of bed. And I was like, that's it. You're not going back down the same path. Like you've got to be the spiritual leader. So yeah, it was during that time when I became Catholic with Angela, that was one thing that really hurt her too, is beside the drugs and everything, is she felt like she met, she married somebody who wanted to be a practicing Catholic. And it yeah. turned out she married a guy who loved her and wanted to marry her, but hadn't fully accepted that part of the deal, even though I said yes to it. So that was very hurtful, you know, for a long time to her as well. Yeah. But, you know, I, uh, 
once I met the Lord, you know, in the way I did in that jail cell. And ever since it's like, I, you know, Sarbella, I read 70 Catholic books in the first year, um, you know, after I was out of jail and I it just was on fire for him and um, started to realize that, you know, the, the theme of the podcast is, you know, welcome to the pew, the place where everyday guys talk about mm-hmm. everyday things in front of the one person that could do something about it, Jesus Christ. And I just started realizing through that men's group that every man had their own, like had the same issues. The devil yeah. wants to convince yeah. us that like, I'm the only person that drinks too much, or I'm the only person that does oh, drugs God. or watches porn. Or, and, and so we feel isolated. But um, I realized in that room that there were so many men that were, that were finding healing in, in a relationship with the Lord through the vulnerability we were sharing. And so that the podcast, like the first 50 episodes were made up of little pieces of paper that I, I ripped up and threw in a hat and asked guys who weren't sharing and everybody in the room to write down what they struggle with in, in one or two words. And so you'd get anger, humility, porn, lust, alcohol, uh, working too much. Mm-hmm. And so we started talking about all those things. And next thing you know, we got a podcast that's been listened to in a hundred and something countries around the world. Guys are talking about how their lives are being changed. They're becoming better fa- husbands and fathers because of the way that they're, they're receiving the Lord through the way we're ministering. And it's just been a crazy ride, my friend. <laughs> that's because yeah, you were open and, yeah. and you were vulnerable, as you said, and you shared and that inspired others and, and praise be to God. Um, just uh, how many years now has it been uh, that guy in the pew, uh, just the guy in the so, pew? How um, so that's been two years running. Uh, we're, we'll be in the third wow. year of it this October. So yeah, it just, I never had the intention of, and I tell people this all the time, like I have no desire to be some famous Catholic speaker or anything. I, <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just not what I started out to. I, I started yeah. in small groups and I saw that what we were doing could help men and the Lord started calling me into this, you know, just making it more and more mm-hmm. apparent. It was never like I went to somebody and said, Hey, I want a podcast. It just happened. You know, it, it wasn't like I said, Hey, I want to do videos and daily reflections, you know, people started asking me to do that. And I was trying to fill a need for people that, that wanted help. It was never, I want to be this. And quite frankly, I was scared to death all the time. Charpel, just oh, wow. like, who am I? And what am I? You know, why do I need to talk to people about Jesus? And I'm, <laughs> I'm probably saying tons of heretical things, like you know, <laughs> all of that, but the Lord's used it. And even to start virtual Catholic conference and all yeah, that stuff too. Um, yeah. uh, just uh, how many years, uh, I'm just trying to get this timeline right. The sure. Um, so the two years. When would you say when you gave that first testimony there to those men? Yeah. What? How long ago was that? That was 20. I was arrested in March on March 23rd of 2016. Uh, so that would have been 2018 is when I gave that that, that talk at that wow. uh, witness. Very raw. Yeah. Only three years. This is still yeah. new. Yeah. Yeah. God. Now we'll have to it ask. Still is. I, I, I cry a lot when I tell it. It still is. Yeah. <laughs> it's been oh, five years, you know. It's very moving. Um, how your yeah. wife today? Um, I've got to ask. Uh, how is everything going now? So yeah. the work you're doing. How's your relationship? Yeah. Um, it's amazing. The family life. Yeah, it's amazing. I, I tell you what. There was times where, and the devil never wants to let you go, right? He, yeah. He's always he's always got that that string that I believe one of the saints or somebody said that a bird can't fly even with one <laughs> thin you know string holding them to the ground. Uh, the devil wants that string to still be on your foot, and so there was a lot of times when I was trying to change my life, and, and I say this to uh, when I give talks to addicts a lot, uh, mm-hmm. or people that are recovering or that are are trying to to change their life is when you've been addicted to something, There's you want everything to be fixed because now you're being different, right? So when I started reading the Bible and praying every night and doing all these things, I wanted my wife to just say, okay, you're better now and things are better. But that wasn't the case. I put my wife through 10 years of, of speaking to her in ways that somebody shouldn't speak to their wife mm-hmm. um, and not helping her and it just being very selfish all these things. I'd been available when I wanted to, the selfishness. So I couldn't change all that overnight. And, you know, it used to hurt, you know, I'd go, why don't you see what I'm doing? I'm leading Mm. men's ministry. I'm reading the Bible. What is it ever going to be enough for you? You're always waiting for the other shoe to drop. And the thing that I came to realize was that I can't make anybody do anything, right? The the one opinion that needs to matter in our life is God's. And even though it hurt me so much that I couldn't prove to my wife that I was changing, that I would never do cocaine again, that I wouldn't be the guy that that I was anymore and how painful it was for me that she wasn't seeing it. um, I had to remember how much pain I'd caused her and that the reason 
that she doubted the way she is was because I picked, I painted the picture of who I was to her for so long. So that wasn't going to change overnight. So I had to quit caring about, okay, this hurts because I want her to, to, to believe me and to trust me and to love me, but she's not going to do that right now. And I can't make her do that. So the only opinion that matters is God's. What does God think of me? What does God want of me? I, I started to, to, to realize I was his beloved son. And no matter what had happened in my life, that he loved me and that he knew I could be better. And he designed me for a purpose, right? That there was a reason for my life and that I was going to find out what that was. And along the way, when I quit worrying about trying to prove to her I was different and actually became different, mm -hmm. things started to heal. Right When she saw me doing it, not talking, but living it, being the first one up and ready for church, having the kids loaded in the car, going to extra things around the parish, yes. going more readily to spend time with her family, doing the things I'd never done and doing them not just to prove it to her, but because I wanted to. I wanted to make up for all the things that I'd done wrong. I wanted the years back with my kids that I lost. And so it's funny. You ask what's happened. My wife started a walking with purpose group in the parish uh, back in the fall with 30 something women in it. She is a way better Catholic than I'll ever be. I always tell people, people go, it's such a great story, your conversion. Well, there's two heroes in it and I'm not one of them. Jesus <laughs> Christ and my wife, Angela, those are the two heroes wow. of that story. And Beautiful. so we're equally yoked now. Charbel. I mean, we we're praying Love together it. with the kids. We're going to mass all the time. We're, we're, we just, we're mm -hmm. on the same place. And God's at the center of our marriage and of our relationship. Yes. And, uh, and, and people ask me all the time, well, do you ever want to go back to, to, you know, to cocaine? If you hear Eric Clapton's cocaine song, come on, do you ever want to go back to, and I say, you know what? Sometimes there's a, there's an inkling or something when you hear it mentioned and you, you have that little shock to your system. But then all I do is I look over at my wife and my children, or I look at that crucifix and I know, I know the person on that crucifix. He's mm -hmm. not just an idea anymore. I, I know him. And mm -hmm. I would never do anything to turn away from him or my wife or children again, no matter what the devil throws at me. Amen. Praise be to God. Well, thank yeah. you. Wow. I can't yeah. believe we're out of time. I could go for three yeah. hours. Here. Um, I'm sorry. Um, this is phenomenal. I feel like we've got to do more. And I, I think maybe it would be great to have you on later on, on, on sort of maybe let's deal with, how do we deal with addictions? How do we deal with these, sure. these real key areas? Um, there are many people watching now and what I love about your story, it's just ordinary, you're an ordinary guy on the outside, you know, you had it all uh, together. People wouldn't have had any idea what you were going through and you were hiding it, keeping it secret. You had this double life and you were suffering on the other side um, and, and you just, you pushed through and how many people today are doing that and how many people are silent about, about it, wanting yeah. to change and they just can't get them. So, if how do people get in touch with you? Uh, tell us what are the web, sure. what are the links? Um, uh, tell sure, us how to yeah. more about what you yeah, do. Yeah, well, the main the main place you can find everything we're doing is just a guy in the pew dot com. So it's just a guy in the pew dot com. Okay. There you could support the ministry financially. You can become a patron. You get some cool gifts like this mug or this shirt, stuff nice. like that. Um, we also have some virtue based programs that you can get involved with there. Um, but you can hear all the podcasts there. I'm starting to do interviews like this, Charvel, and, and you and I have talked right. about you coming on. I'd be glad to have you on. Uh, it'd be a great <laughs> honor to have you on. But we've got interviews with Father Larry, Father John Ricardo, uh, Jason Everett, all those guys, uh, Father Just Johnson. So um, you can find all of that there at justagowinthepew.com and listen to everything we're doing or, or get involved there. Yeah, fantastic. And, um, and of course, I mean, many of our viewers are familiar with the Virtual Catholic Conference. We've been promoting sure. every single one of the major yeah. ones. Um, and that website, just for anyone who wants to see all of them in one place, where sure. can they go? Yeah, that's virtualcatholicconference.com. And that okay. is a whole other story in of itself. I know. <laughs> we could talk we about. had uh, so. yeah, Matt Ingold uh, in uh, shared his amazing story and, and, and touched yeah. on it. But we, we, we probably, maybe we can do something with both of you on, on just Virtual Catholic Conference. That would be fun. Um, yeah, that would be sure. fun. Well, th thank yeah. you so much. Please pray for us. Uh, we're praying for you. And um, let, let's, this is the beginning of, 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 I think, a lot more to come. So thank you again. Well, and, thank you. And, and God bless you. God bless you too, Charvel. Thanks for having me. To everyone there, thanks. That's another podcast. you got to get to know more about this man. What an amazing story. Uh, please pray for him, his ministry. Get involved and visit that just a guy in a pew.com. Uh, links are below. That's another Perusia podcast. I'm Shabba Rashi, host. Thank you again and God bless. <laughs>